Units and standards. We use units to basically communicate different uh, quantities and by having them all standardized it allows one scientist to look at the work done by another scientist or another research group and understand exactly what's being uh, given. So standardized units again uh, just like having a common language we have these common uh, amounts which are well known, well defined and every measurement in science is compared to some standardized set of units. Now one of the oldest systems that's still in use today is the uh, English or Imperial system, sometimes known as the U.S. Customary system because well, we're one of the few countries who still use it in the United States. But most scientists really favor the metric system. And the old British or U.S. Customary system was great for the marketplace where uh, length was in inches, feet, yards, and uh, mile. Uh, weight was ounces, pounds, tons. Um, but, of course, uh, these were, you know, of course the foot was uh, sort of standardized to a, to a person's uh, foot size. The yard would be about standardized to the, the distance between the tip of the finger to the, to the uh, shoulder. Um, Great for doing approximate measurements when you're not too concerned about giving too much or giving too little. But for science, it's really not a great system because the conversion from one unit to another doesn't really follow our number system. So the metric system was originally uh, first uh, developed or it, it started coming into play around 1670. And, uh, Again, it was proposed as a system of units based on powers of 10. Our own number system is based on powers of 10. So the, this type of system fits really, really well. The idea was to come up with some base and then put a metric unit in front of it or a metric prefix in front of it. So for instance, centa, we know a centimeter is 1 one hundredth of a meter. Centa therefore represents 10 to the minus 2 or 1 one hundredth. A millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter, so millimeter um, represents 10 to the minus 3. And we can get down to much smaller units, which are, are more common today. The micrometer is very, very common in biology. The nanometer is very common in physics and in optics. Uh, picometer, femtometer is also known as a Fermi, um, using the prefix femto which means 10 to the minus 15. The large uh, end in the uh, prefixes, which are greater than 1, we have the most common kilo. So a kilogram is 1,000 grams. Um, megagram would be uh, sometimes also called the metric ton, a million grams. And then we have some of these other prefixes which we actually see more commonly used in computer science. Uh, a little bit strange here because the true megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte is actually based on powers of 2 rather than powers of 10. So for instance, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good way to uh, uh, do this translation. Um, you know, whereas 1024 would be uh, the equivalent of kilo in, um, in computer science would be 2 to the 10th power. Uh, in the true metric system, you know, kilo just represents 1 1,000. But we, we use it a lot in, in computer science because you know, it gets a pretty good approximation to the metric prefixes. Kilo, me mega, giga, gigabyte is very common. We can buy uh, hard drives now in the terabyte uh, region, and of course, uh, petabyte. Um, we're even talking about petaflops, how many floating point operations we can do uh, per second. So again, the whole idea of units are just a way to communicate some quantity. Um, the unit, of course, must be defined. It must be calibrated. We must be able to give our results to somebody else but have them also on the same page, you know, understanding the quantities that's being calibrated the same way that we do it. 
So defining units, again, allows for communication, just like by speaking all the same language, we can communicate efficiently with somebody else. By having all the same units, we can communicate our quantities very, very well. The most important or fundamental quantities that we talk about in this course are based on length, mass, and time. Actually, we'll see later on, you can actually base it on other things such as current, the amp, um, I'm trying to think of the other uh, fundamental unit. It might be the candela, but again, for us, we will use length, mass, and time as some of the most fundamental units, and then from those, build some other units on top of those. Now, the SI, or Système International, is a set of units, whereas with the metric system, you've got all these metric prefixes, you can create just about any size unit that you want. Within the metric system, we have SI, okay? It's a subset of the metric system where only one unit is chosen of all the different quantities that are available through metric prefixes. And sometimes we call the SI units the MKS system because it chooses the meter, the kilogram, and the second, length, mass, and time respectively, um, as the unit. Uh, again, amp for electric current, Kelvin. Forget about that absolute temperature. In the metric system, we oftentimes use Celsius. In the SI system, it's actually Kelvin because Kelvin starts at absolute zero. Okay, how are these defined? Now again, we have a number of different physical phenomena at all different sizes in, in length, in all different sizes in mass, and all different times. Um, but again, when we're using the MKS system, meter, kilogram, second, those are going to be the units that we want to define. And then we can use metric prefixes to build off those. Okay, so length. The SI unit for length is meters. You need to know this. Okay? Um, the original meter was actually defined by a fractional distance between the equator of the Earth and the pole. The problem with this is, depending on how you travel, these distances can be slightly different because the surface of the Earth is not completely round. Okay, so as we got to higher and higher precision, where we need, needed more and more um, places in, our, in, in terms of uh, decimal places, uh, or significant figures as we're going to talk about later on, we needed something that we could define even more precisely. So for length, we actually define the meter as being the time that light will travel in a vacuum. Light will slow down in, in, in things like glass or water, but if we could completely evacuate a chamber and sun, send light through it, this would be the distance that light would travel in one, okay, there's a fraction, one over 299,792,408 mm -hmm. eighths of a second, okay? So that seems very, you know, random in terms of, of these numbers right here. But again, it was really a way of taking the old meter based on distances on the Earth and incorporating it with something that was uh, very measurable, okay? We can measure how far light is going to travel in this time. And because we can measure time very precisely with atomic clocks, we can get uh, quite, a, quite a bit of precision here. And here you can see it is measured out to nine significant figures, something that we'll come across a little bit later on. Now, all of the metric units of length are defined from the standard meter. So if you want to come up with a, a calibration for kilometer, you just multiply this by a thousand. If you want it a millimeter, you divide by a thousand. There is an actual physical uh, standardized um, bar which is one meter in length. Uh, there's one at the National Institute of Technology. It's made out of platinum iridium, which is a very, very inert metal. It doesn't really um, chemically react with anything, so you know, it can't change its length through, due to oxidation. And it's kept at a very precise temperature. Um, there's also another one kept in Europe. And again, here's some different uh, 
measured lengths uh, based on the meter. And of course, um, if you want to be clever, you could take metric prefixes and replace some of these lengths. Mass, um, mass, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram, MKS. The kilogram, this is a little bit strange that we have a metric unit where the base unit is not actually the SI unit. Uh, meter is the base unit for length. Um, second is the base unit for time. Amp or ampere is the base unit for current and Kelvin is the base unit for temperature. So mass is a little bit different. Um, probably has to do with the history of how these things were defined because a gram is a really, really small amount of mass. It was felt that a kilogram was a more realistic amount of mass to calibrate and therefore we have this. Um, there's some dispute as to how we calibrate uh, mass. Um, originally it was based on the idea that 12 kilograms would have um, the same mass as a, a thousand times Avogadro's uh, atoms of, of uh, carbon-12. Um, but again, there's actually, I should update this a little bit, a new way that we uh, define uh, the kilogram. So again, done to a very, very high level of precision. And again, here's some different uh, masses and how they compare to the basic kilogram. So time is probably the best of the units to uh, calibrate because we can actually, um, you know, calibrate time against a uh, physical phenomena that's very easy to measure with the uh, proper equipment. You've probably heard the uh, term atomic clock, and sometimes you'll see a clock which is supposed to be powered by an atomic clock. Well, actually, it's probably powered by or calibrated by a radio signal, which is then um, being operated in conjunction with an atomic clock. But an atomic clock it sounds like it's, you know, it's a nuclear clock or something. It actually has cesium-133 atoms in it. And they cause these cesium-133 atoms to oscillate back and forth. It's a microwave of... Uh, uh, transmission because it's happening at uh, 9.2 uh, gigahertz and the, the cesium just like a pendulum will, will swing at a natural frequency depending on its length the cesium will oscillate at a very natural frequency which is 9 billion 192 million 631 thousand 770 times a second so therefore the second is based on those oscillations. And you can see that the, the second is calibrated to a, a very high degree of precision. You have 10 significant figures right here. So therefore uh, we can come up with very, very precise measurements for time. Use the time to find the meter. And um, again, kilogram is actually uh, calibrated uh, now a little closer to a little closer in conjunction with the, with the second and the meter. And again, here at different times, add your own metric prefix to come up with a different value. So MKS, that's really what we're going to use most of the semester. Meters, kilograms, seconds. We can put some of these together to create compound units. So for instance, when we talk about or describe an object's motion, we want to talk about its position in meters. We want to talk about its speed in meters per second. And we can even talk about its acceleration, how much the velocity is changing per time in meters per second squared. So you can see these two new units that we came up with, we're just using two base units that we had already, two um, SI units that we had already putting them together. How many meters, how much length do you have for a given amount of time? How much velocity change, how many meters per second change every second? Acceleration. We can also build even higher level, maybe higher level, 
um, units, such as the unit for force, which is based not only on acceleration, as we'll see from Newton's second law, but also mass. So here you have the unit of mass, the unit of length, and in the denominator, squared, the unit of time. Energy, we just multiply Newton's times meters, so it becomes um, kilograms meters squared per second squared, and watts, which are units of power, then become um, kilograms meters squared per second to the third power. But they're all based on the meter, the kilogram, and the second. Now again, I'm using the term precision quite a bit. Accuracy and precision are sometimes used synonymously, but they're not the same in science. Accuracy is when we make a measurement, how close is that actual measurement to the real value? Okay, how close do we come to the real value? If you have, well, rather rudimentary uh, equipment and you're performing an experiment, you're probably not going to come up with you know, really great answers all the time. So you might suffer in terms of accuracy. Maybe there's a systematic error. Um, other errors can come into play. Precision is that when we make many measurements, how much do these measurements agree? Again, better equipment generally has higher precision, which means that as we make the measurements, the difference between one measurement and another is much less. We can do things to improve precision, such as eliminate vibrations that might make a scale go back and forth. Um, we might eliminate things like temperature uh, fluctuations. But again, precision, how consistent the measurements are, one to another, accuracy, how um, correct the actual answers are. Now, when you do an experiment, oftentimes you'll measure precision in terms of percent difference. Um, in one of the first experiments that we do in physics, we actually measure precision using something called standard deviation. How much do the measurements vary from one another um, with the statistical measurement. Accuracy is typically quantified in terms of uh, percent error, okay? How much is your measured value in error compared to what the actual value should be? So again, systems of measurement, uh, the whole idea here is whenever we make a measurement, we want to compare it to a calibrated unit already. That's why we've agreed on you know, these systems of units. Uh, again, in the United States, for the everyday world, we still tend to use the U.S. customary or British system. But for science, uh, we like to use the metric system. Uh, SI, again, are units which are a subset of that metric system. Sometimes you'll come across other units. Uh, CGS is one of the more common units. Um, at, sometimes it's called the Gaussian system. And uh, instead of meters, kilograms, and seconds, we have centimeters, grams, and seconds. So sometimes you'll see that also.